Hey, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today what we're doing is a discussion. I was about to say debate. It's not a debate. It's a dialogue on the argument from limits. And you may never actually have heard of this argument, but what we'll be doing today, I've got Dr. Josh Rasmussen right below me, and then Joe Schmid, who will eventually get his doctorate at some point in his life. And uh, so we'll eventually be calling him Dr. Schmid. Uh Eventually. But anyways, no, uh, there's this argument from limits. I actually used it in a debate that I did with um, Stephen Woodford, Professor Woodford. And uh, we, we had a debate on the Kalam cosmological argument. It, it's an argument for uh, you can I guess you can put it in these way, in these terms. It's an argument for the existence of God. But really what it is, is it's a kind of stage two argument. If you're not familiar with stage two arguments, uh, in cosmological arguments, arguments for the existence of God from s some like general feature of reality, uh, like the beginning of the universe or the fact that any contingent things exist. Uh, there are these arguments, these cosmological arguments. And uh, one philosopher, William Rowe, he helpful, help, helpfully, helpfully, is that a, it's so late for me. And it's not even that late. It's only 7 p.m. My brain is just not working right now. Uh, Anyways, so there's these two stages of this argument, and William Rowe, this philosopher, he, he helped to make this distinction uh, just to kind of put the argument into to two different parts. So the first part, you may, uh, stage one establishes that, say, like some necessary being exists or like a first cause exists, and then stage two arguments try to bridge the gap from a necessary foundation or a first cause all the way to God. So this thing does have these divine properties like omniscience and omnipotence and as perfectly loving or, or all these other different divine properties. And so this argument comes into play. It's a stage two argument. So it tries to bridge the gap between this first stage and uh, God, basically. So, uh, but what I wanted to do as we kind of kick things off here, because both of these guys, Josh has been on the channel multiple times, Joe as well. And so we don't really need to do uh, very long winded introductions. If you'd like to learn more about them or go visit their channels, check the description. But what I'd like to do, Josh, is uh, hand things over to you and give you a little bit of time at the beginning just to spell out in more detail what the argument is and then from there we'll go directly into dialogue and Joe can offer some of his pushback he's got like um, I don't know if you've counted is it like 2,000 objections or around there a lot he's got a lot of things to say on this argument um, oh it looks like they're they're both muted hang on now everyone should be able to hear them yeah uh, well yeah let's turn it over to, to, to Josh take it away Start okay, a, thank you. Help us help yes. us understand this argument. Oh, uh, Cameron, I'm I'm so glad to be doing this with with you and with Joe. And Joe, it's just so great to have this conversation again. You know, we've been doing this sort of in back channels. I love this video that you made about this. And at, toward the end, you said that if we kind of go back and forth, back and forth, and maybe this goes on perpetually, forever and ever and ever. And and I like to tell people that the love language of philosophers is arguments. So I think this shows that Joe and I have a great deal of love for each other. We like to, uh, you know, kind of check each other's arguments. And I had something in the notes about framing, and I, I want to talk a little bit about framing before getting into the argument, because I think that's going to be kind of helpful. Um, before you do that, you just reminded me, yeah. you, you reminded me that I, I should have given some context for this dialogue. So what we were originally going to do, so Joe put out a video on his channel and it's basically just a sort of response. I think it was around 30 to 45 minutes uh, of a response to the argument from limits that was presented in this really long four and a half hour stream that I did with Dr. Chad McIntosh and all these different arguments for the existence of God. And uh, what, what we were originally going to do is have, I was going to invite Josh on and we were going to kind of do a response, just the two of us. But as I was sitting and thinking about it, I was like, you know what, it'd be probably better in a couple ways to, to just have a dialogue with the two of them instead of doing this sort of back and forth on the videos, which I mean, there's, there's value in doing each one, but I was just thinking, you know, it'd be fun to do this. And so uh, both of them agreed and and that's how we, we got here. So I, I yeah, meant I to mention that at the very beginning. Yeah. Thank you. I think this will be a lot of fun. And I sort of anticipate that what's going to happen is we're going to begin with maybe some packaged ideas that we have kind of in our minds. We're going to kind of try them out on each other. 
And then we're going to move into this kind of fresh, fun territory where we're exploring together. And I think this is something that I really appreciate about Joe. Um, the cool thing about you, Joe, is that I always feel like you understand me and you get me. And it actually just feels really good, like as a human being, to be honest, mm -hmm. like you don't misrepresent my ideas. You display them very charitably and you come up with different possible interpretations. And, and I feel like you get my values as well, um, which I appreciate. And so I anticipate that we're going to be able to kind of explore some ground together. And I was thinking that this will also be kind of fun for the audience to sort of see how uh, some philosophers, and I'm going to call Joe um, a philosopher, you know, I mean, you're, you're not yet in the PhD program, but you've already been producing things as a professional philosopher. So um, I consider it really an honor. Like, so the, to me, this is, this is um, two philosophers getting together to think hard about an interesting topic. And my whole goal in this conversation is to see if we can get some clarity together, see if we can explore some things. Um, kind of going back to this point about how I feel like you understand my, my thoughts. I was thinking, Joe, about how you would analyze aspects of my arguments and my ideas. And then you might send me an email and sort of ask me some questions. And to me, it, it's, it's really cool. It's kind of like you're saying, hey, Josh, look at this thing that I found in your mind. Like, what's that? And I'm like, Joe, like, I, I didn't even remember that I had that in my mind. Like, that's interesting. I'm not sure if I like that there or not, but let's think about that. So this is just, I think, going to be a lot of fun and very productive. That's my anticipation. Uh, my prediction is that by the end of the conversation, both of us are going to see something new. Um, so this is not just going to be defending a prior uh, structure. And, and I want to just like acknowledge even to myself that some part of my ego might be connected to some of my creations. So I'm sort of human like that. And because this argument from limits is something that I've been thinking about and developing, I became aware. I found I noticed myself feeling kind of protective of the argument. Like, you know, maybe if there's a certain form of the argument that gets interpreted, it's like, well, maybe there's another way of forming the argument. And I really want to try to let go of that as much as possible. Maybe join Joe in smashing the argument if we can do that together and just see if we can discover some things together. Um, because I think that that's going to be fruitful. So I wanted just to say that in terms of framing, um, I think sometimes these arguments get, they get used in a, a sort of contest. I think there's value for that. I was thinking about this in terms of chess players in a, in a combat. They're actually experimenting with different openings and, and different positions in the combat. And the combat actually helps with those experiments. So I think lots of good ideas come through the contest. But I also think that there can be sort of a, a constructive um, project where we're kind of, to use a metaphor that Joe, that you shared with me years ago, um, painting, painting together. And so maybe we can paint some things together. And yeah, I, I, I remember, do you remember this, Joe, when I said, I, I feel like you're kind of a builder with pipes. And then you said, well, thanks, Josh, but I kind of prefer a painting metaphor. And I thought, yeah, painting is actually more beautiful. So I like that metaphor better. And uh, so I hope it's okay for me to point to that metaphor here, because I feel like that's what I want to do with you. Yeah, I distinctly remember sending that email and I was like, yeah, plumber is interesting, but it's much more elegant. It's much more, I don't know, it's it's an expression of humanity of sorts, this uh, uh, engagement with the majesty of reason and with each other and with uh, uh, reason and, you know, testing these arguments, being on the same side, being on the same team and not sort of combating in that way, uh, which is helpful with the framing, right? Uh, the way that we frame these debates and discussions and I mean, it just affects, it affects how we think about them and it affects how we think about others. So I think um, it's, it's been a really valuable tool in my mind to frame these, not as debates, not as different sides going against one another, but trying to probe the truth together uh, and probing not with uh, plumber's tools, but with uh, palettes and brush strokes and things like that. That's it. Yeah. And I want to also say, Joe, you've helped me. Uh, you've helped update my thinking on this. I've got a few updates um, in my notes. Not all of them are written down. And, and some of these are directly in re relationship to you. Um, so, so I think that's where when people work together, um, they, they can help each other. And I've been helped by you very, very much over the years. So I want to start yeah, with and that of course. before getting to the argument. And I, I cannot uh, emphasize how incalculably much you've helped me over the years. So uh, yeah, in, in every way, shape and form in my philosophical development. So yeah. Cool. All right, Cameron, do you want me to give the argument? Yes, enough gushing. Let's get into the argument. Let's, yeah, enough uh, of this. Enough of this. <laughs> yeah, let, let's do uh, let's just a rough overview. Let's, let's 
rough overview of what the argument is so that everyone can be on the same page and then we can just launch into uh, Joe's thoughts. And, and it, you guys are working from an outline that you sort of worked on together. So um, we can just follow that closely or loosely. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I, I'm just here for the ride. So I just, I'm going to try to sit back as much as I can and just enjoy the conversation. That sounds good. I sort of feel the same way. I feel like we're all kind of here, here for this ride. So uh, first, I just wanted to say kind of how I think about this argument. I find it helpful to think about it as a, a tool and the strategy um, that the tool is helping us to think about the fundamental reality. We're just going to assume that there is some kind of base reality, we'll leave open its nature. And I call this an argument from limits or argument from arbitrary limits. And I think of the, the goal of the argument is to see if I can have a theory of fundamental reality that reduces arbitrariness uh, as far as I can. So that's kind of like a seed idea. And then that idea can sprout into different forms of the argument. And I was realizing that even in my published work, I do have different forms of the argument. And so some uh, critiques might apply to certain forms better than to other forms. And it may not be sort of fair in a way for me to kind of wiggle around different critiques by moving to other forms of the argument. Um, I really want to sort of match the critique with the argument so we can display that. But that's kind of how I'm thinking of, of the sort of goal of the argument. And then I have an outline of some steps and we'll walk through those. But just to kind of illustrate this, I've got a prop over here. Okay, so here's a question for the audience. This object here, I assume you've not seen its origin. I mean, I, I've not seen its origin. So I have no visual evidence or empirical evidence at all that tells me about the origin. So here's a hypothesis. This is the foundation of reality. It produced everything else and then entered into its production. And somehow I found it. I mean, my kids were playing with it. It's like, well, what is that? And, and so here it is. This is fundamental reality right here. Now, what's interesting to me right away is that I can't really rule out this hypothesis by any kind of direct observation. My direct observations don't tell me whether this is fundamental reality. I think that instead what I need is some kind of analysis of my observations. And my analysis is going to help me to think about um, two ways in which I think one could argue that this is not fundamental reality. I'm assuming that most people in the audience, at least most, are skeptical that this is the fundamental reality. Okay, I, I'm assuming that that's true. But the question is like, well, why be skeptical of that? And here are two kind of strategies. One is you could argue that this um, is probably not capable of producing the rest of the things that we see. Uh, we see um, trees, we see leaves, we, we maybe witness thoughts in our own minds and feelings. And you might have the sense that this is not the kind of thing that could produce those things. So you could think of this as kind of an argument from the effects that you look at the effects and then you can say something about ultimate reality. It's probably not this because this wouldn't be able to produce those effects. Another kind of argument would be to apply the analysis, not to the effects, but just to the nature of the thing itself. And you could make the argument that this isn't the kind of thing that could be fundamental. And this is where the argument from arbitrary limits would come in, which is an argument that here's one reason to think this isn't fundamental. It's because it has some particular um, attributes like being pink, having a certain shape, um, a certain you know, number of sides. And each of these attributes, one might think, are arbitrary in a certain respect that call for deeper explanation. Like if it's pink, why, why pink rather than blue? You might think that being pink sort of calls for further explanation. And if that's right, that would be some reason to think that this isn't fundamental reality because this thing has a particular set of attributes that are sort of arbitrary, wouldn't probably be fundamental. I really have to know what is that thing? <laughs> I've, it's the fundamental reality, Cameron. The... I don't know. <laughs> I didn't see this thing oh. come into being. Who knows? Oh, well, I, know you have, I know you have kids, but what is it? Like, I, I've never seen that in my life. Well, here's another little bit of reality. You can mm. attach them. And if mm. you put enough of these together in the right way, then the combination will start having feelings. You know, you kind of got to watch out for that. You can start constructing a feeling <laughs> being and get it in the right way. So I, who knows what that is exactly. But you can use reason to argue that it's probably not fundamental reality. And I want to just mm -hmm. use the same kind of tool of reasoning, the same kind of tool to think about other hypotheses about fundamental reality. And I think it is actually useful to start with sort of clear cases. This has kind of helped me in my own work. Sometimes people say, well, you can't use reason to be confident of anything about fundamental reality. 
fundamental reality is too far away. It's too, it's too obscure. It's too philosophical to use reason to, to get to anything clear. But I, I actually think you can use reason to get pretty clear that this is not fundamental reality. And so that opens up the floodgate to me to think about, well, what else, what other hypotheses can we sort of clear from the table? Um, so before I get to the argu argument outline, Joe, do you have any general thoughts about just kind of setting up the strategy? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's helpful to delineate those two different ways, one looking at the effects and the other one looking at the nature of the thing itself. Um, before going on to the argument itself, we might want to get some clarifications on what we mean by arbitrariness. So yeah. for the audience, you know, you can distinguish between being unexplained, so being in fact unexplained, versus being inexplicable, right? That is not possibly having an explanation. So we can delineate those two, and I think we should clarify for the audience which one of those is at play in the notion of arbitrariness. And then you also might want to include in the notion of arbitrariness, and we're going to clarify whether or not we're going to include that. Things like it genuinely could have been otherwise, like the property or the feature in question or the object in question. Uh, maybe it seemingly could have been otherwise, regardless of whether or not it could have been otherwise, or maybe it's conceivably otherwise. Uh, or maybe none of the above, should we include none of those? So I think we should get some clarity on what exactly arbitrariness is. Yeah, that's good. So the way that I'm thinking of arbitrariness here is it's kind of accentuating two different concepts in a way. Um, one is the concept of just having no explanation. You know, so um, if let's say this is fundamental, then if it's fundamental, then in that sense has no explanation. So it's arbitrary. But there's this other sense of arbitrary, which is sort of the limit side of it. Um, it, it's the side that maybe calls for further explanation. And the one way of thinking about it is that it's a particular um, quality on a continuum of alternative degrees. Um, you could think of these as alternatively conceivable degrees. One way that I've uh, expressed this in my, I expressed this in my dialogue with Felipe, you might remember this in our book, It's God, the Best Explanation of Things. I talked about arbitrariness as a degree that's a non-maximal um, parameter where uh, reason doesn't preclude greater or lesser than degrees of that. So for example, if it were um, 10 meters tall, reason doesn't preclude there being something that's 11 uh, uh, meters tall or feet, feet tall, wh whatever it is, you know, so reason allows greater and lesser sizes. And so a fundamental reality where like precisely the shape of like a tree with 10 to the 47 um, leaves or something, then I would think that that would be a kind of arbitrary limit in the sense that it's a particular quality on a continuum of more or less, and it, it, um, it, it would be without explanation. Um, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. We could actually probably drop the word arbitrary and just talk about limits, but I kind of like that word arbitrary sort of, I think it gets your mind sort of in the right conceptual territory. It's like, it's an arbitrary limit. Well, why is it that limit rather than more or less? Does that kind of make sense in terms of the argument? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So maybe I could just go to the outline and then. Yeah. I was thinking yeah, maybe you ahead. could firstly, uh, hmm, lay out the argument like premise by premise. And then we sort of, uh, of course, maybe explicate or clarify terms. And then maybe we just like camp out on each premise or, you know, like just briefly yeah. just go through successively the, the premises. Cause there might be some different things that I want to say on each and multiple points underneath. And I kind of did that in my blue stuff that I wrote on their outline. So, so yeah. yeah, I love that. I agree with that hundred percent. That sounds great. So the, um, so I have different versions of the argument and, and I'm going to call this a classical version from value. There are some other lines that I'll touch on later. Um, when we look at other features that you might want to sort of look for the, um, an explanation that shaves off the arbitrary limits, but this is focusing on value. So let's just, on my notes here, I have um, the following argument. Let's just assume stage one of the argument gives us some kind of fundamental reality. I'll just call this N, although I don't even want to assume here that it has necessary existence. It's just, it's fundamental in the sense it's not grounded in or caused by or explained in terms of anything prior to that thing. So that's the first step. And okay, I'm going to just say them all quickly and then Joe, we can go through each one to clarify. So then the next step is about limits. Um, the, the premise here is that limits, which we can think of these as non-maximal degrees are um, explicable. 
And we can think of explicable either in terms of a kind of modal notion, like it's possibly explained or logically possibly explained or conceivably explained. Those are all sort of different modal notions. Or we could think of it just is explained or has some explanation. Okay. And for our purposes, I'm, I'm going to just go with uh, um, just has some explanation and we can come back to the modal lines if we want to. I think just for simplicity and ease of presentation, we'll just say, hey, these limits have some explanation. And then if that's right, if there's a fundamental reality and limits have some explanation, then if n, if n has some degree of greatness, where greatness, we can explicate this further, but you could think of this roughly as some kind of value entailing aspect. And I, we'll come back to maybe how we might understand value, but I don't wanna leave that open here. Um, if it has some degree of greatness, and again, you can run this with other attributes too, like if it has some degree of color or power or knowledge or whatever, um, but in, in this case, greatness, then its greatness is not arbitrarily or inexplicably limited. Um, that is to say that it's going to have um, some explanation for its greatness or its greatness is going to be fundamental to the thing itself. Then the next step is that n has some degree of greatness. We'll talk about that. If all that's right, then it looks like n's greatness is not arbitrarily limited. Um, the second to last step is, I have, this is number six. If n's greatness is not arbitrarily limited, then n is in some sense perfect. And we'll talk a bit about what that might mean. And then if all that's right, then it looks like n is in some sense perfect. So this is an argument from arbitrary limits to a kind of perfect foundation that shaves off as many arbitrary limits and boundaries, specifically with respect to greatness, as we can get away with. And my thought is that once we've shaved off the arbitrary limits and boundaries, and this thing has some greatness, its greatness is not arbitrarily limited, and that's gonna reveal a kind of perfect foundation. So that's the outline. And I know, I know Joe, you're very familiar with this. This is not at all new. This is why you've got all of those different angled um, probes that are gonna help us to clarify the argument. Um, maybe tear off some pieces or clarify some parts. So back to you. All right, I had to unmute myself. Um, okay, so the first thing is to clarify, I know we're still in a little bit of a clarification stage, but fundamentality. So uh, there are different ways to analyze fundamentality in the literature, you know, like Jessica Wilson has a primitive concept of it, whereas other people explicate it in terms of being ungrounded. It seems like you want to understand it in terms of simply being unexplained so like in fact unexplained and of course you know we can get into that modal distinction that we got into earlier like there's a distinction between being unexplained and being unexplainable or being ungrounded and ungroundable right so it sounds like you're wanting to understand fundamentality as unexplained yeah in this version we can work with unexplained uh, maybe it's not explained or grounded or caused so it's sort of like really fundamental like there's nothing sort of prior to it um yeah, I mean, we might think that those other relations entail explanatory, like if, if there's if there's a cause of it, then there's some sort of explanation of it in terms of a causal explanation, you might think. Yes, absolutely. And so they're all kind of nested concepts in that way. Um, but and in a way, I almost even want to kind of leave it a little bit open for people to kind of use the argument as a device that they can use to probe fundamental reality, even by their own lights. I mean, one thing that I wanted to say is that um, when you think about explaining limits, you might think that what you want to do is sort of explain or reduce arbitrariness, like as far as you can, kind of by, by your own total evidence. And different people will be on different positions on the epistemic landscape. And so they're going to use the tool and apply it maybe in different ways, but it's, it could still be useful for them as a kind of theoretical device. Um, so anyway, so that's just to kind of review some of the motivation for the argument. All right. So then maybe we could just go through each premise then, if you're cool with that. Let's do um, that. Yes. So the first premise, assume this is just an assumption. So uh, yeah, assume that there is a fundamental reality N. Uh, so that's, like you said, that's sort of, sort of delivered by an appropriate stage one case. And we're not really going to camp out on that for the audience. Um, you know, there are lots of videos on both Cameron's channel, Josh's channel, even my channel, my contingency argument playlist. So um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we're not going to Go on that one much more. The, the uh, only thing you want to say, to say here is that if if that premise is false, okay, that doesn't mean that the rest of the argument has no value because it could still be very interesting to think about the conditional. Like, if there's a fundamental reality, here are some implications. And in fact, it could even be that some of these implications are ones that you have independent reason to deny, and that you go back to that 
starting assumption and you have new reason to doubt that starting assumption, you know, that can happen too. So I do think conditionals in, in philosophy and just in reasoning um, can be very useful and, and helpful. So that's all I want to say here. So yeah, for, we're not going to assume that it's true. I mean, for sake of argument, we're going to assume that it's true and then see what we can build from here. All right. Sounds good. I have to say that a lot in my papers for referees. I'm just like, listen, I'm going to assume this thesis. Uh, if you reject it, right, that doesn't mean you have to, you know, write a stupid referee two number report or whatever. That it's just always means number like, two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's referee number two. I so say, why is it hey, refer- number one it seems to always get it. It's number two that always seems I to. I know, right? not get it there it's inexplicable yeah. it's an arbitrary limit no yeah. uh but but yeah i always have to say uh you know let's if you reject this assumption let's treat my expiration as conditional if we grant that assumption here's a really significant thing that follows anyway um it is so helpful pro tip. i mean so helpful yeah. and just highlighting the value of the conditional because i think you know refs are humans too and they get a little bit defensive they feel like oh you're getting overly excited about your argument over there well let's just make it conditional let's neutralize some of this you know so we get to the cool calm truth of the conditional so anyway, exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So then the second premise, uh, since we're taking it in non-modal terms, it's that limits are explained, essentially. It's that limits are explained. Now, again, you put it limits are explicable, but we're going with the non-modal term or non-modal presentation of it. So I guess if I can just get into one of my reservations here that we can camp out on, I guess, and I say reservation, I mean, again, I, I don't know whether ultimately, I mean, we're just here to explore. So um I guess like we could call this like an Oppian reservation. Yeah. Um, so suppose I accept a theory on which there are necessarily fundamental limits. Uh, indeed, assume if we assume that the no fundamental limits implies theism, as the rest of your argument would arguably show if successful, well, then any non-theistic theory is going to imply fundamental limits. Uh, but then it's going to just fall out of my theory, right? Because we're supposing that I accept a, a non-theistic theory with fundamental limits. It's just going to fall out of my theory that this premise is false. And one might think uh, no headway is made in the dispute between our theories by mounting an argument, one of whose premises comes out as false, according to the theory that I accept. Uh, as uh, Api teaches us, uh, whether one accepts the premises of an argument is a function of what theory one antecedently adopts, right? If you antecedently adopt a theory and someone's trying to mount an argument and it just falls out of your theory that one of those premises is false, that argument is not a threat to you or not a threat to your theory. Uh, and so the argument itself, if this is all right, the argument itself won't doesn't seem to make any headway in the assessment between the competing theories. Now, of course, right, we can discuss w- whether including fundamental limits in one's theory Sorry, I'm breaking up just a little bit. Am I back? Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're back. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what this is. My internet is slightly slow, but as long as you can hear me, yeah. uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can keep. Going. So I will continue. Okay, okay. So of course, right? We can discuss whether including fundamental limits within your theory detracts from, say, the simplicity of your theory, or maybe it's explanatory power in certain respects. And perhaps, perhaps I can grant that it is, in fact, a mark against a theory that it includes fundamental limits. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that won't tell us by itself which theory is true, right? We need to have an overall assessment of the relative merits of the theories in question. And at least for someone like Oppie, Naturalism is going to win out all things considered, even if naturalism's inclusion of fundamental limits is a mark against the theory. But still, like, there's the reason why I bring this up as a worry for the argument is just that uh, when one might think that it reveals that the argument itself doesn't establish theism, since it has a premise that, uh, you know, non-theistic theories and those who accept non-theistic theories will simply reject. Um, Now, again, we can get into theory-based considerations that count against those theories, uh, but going that route seems to grant at least prima facie that the argument from limits itself doesn't get us to theism. So I wonder what you think about that. Oh, I like this a lot. And I think it also points to the value of kind of thinking of the argument as sort of a tool that people could kind of use by their own, the the light of their own worldview. So it might be that um, I'm kind of trying to come up with a theory that has theoretical virtues and minimizes theoretical costs. And it might be that, as you put it, Joe, that um, having these fundamental parameters, like let's say it's fundamentally blue. Um, if Now, I don't know anybody who has a theory that is fundamentally blue, so I'm going to beat up on a theory that nobody has. But just to illustrate the point, which is that um, I could maybe think that, yeah, now this blue foundation theory, 
um, has a, a theoretical cost. In fact, I'm going to coin this the term bluis, bluism. Okay, bluism, there's naturalism, theism, and there's bluism. So bluism is now on the table of contenders. It's, it's out there. And I could admit that by Rasmussen's, arg Rasmussen's argument over there, that guy over there protecting his argument, that he actually is giving me a defeater for bluism because bluism posits this fundamental limit, uh, or this fundamental quality of blue. And I'm wondering, well, why blue rather than red? But it turns out through other reasons and considerations, blue, maybe through science or s some kind of empirical observations, blue has a great explanatory power and is doing some work in, in my theory. And so Rasmussen's argument just does, does not demonstrate that I'm wrong. And that's a beautiful thing because now I'm still helped by, his, by this argument from arbitrary limits because I'm recognizing there's a kind of cost here. And if I actually can come up with a new theory that um, accounts for all the data I want to account for and doesn't have that cost, then by my own lights, I'm going to think that new theory is a better theory. And, and that could be helpful, even while granting that it doesn't like force everybody into one conclusion. So that, that's the first thought. The second thought, is that I think it is going to depend on kind of like how much of a cost it is. And this might just depend on your total considerations on behalf of that principle that limits have a further explanation. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about how one might motivate that principle and maybe suggest that it could be actually a pretty steep cost. Um, and then, but, but before I come back to that, I wanna just make a third point. This is something I've been thinking a lot about in terms of kind of the purpose of arguments. I think sometimes, Arguments are sort of, they're presented as these devices of demonstrating a position. And that demonstration almost has this kind of like view from nowhere, third person quality of like rational triumph. And then I almost like wonder if that actually sort of inspires all of the skeptics, um, including my own skeptical parts to be like, wait a second. I mean, how can the argument force everybody to agree with it? when everybody's at different places in the epistemic landscape. I mean, and so I've, I've actually wondered if maybe thinking about arguments in that strong way is, is not very helpful um, for helping people get to truth. And I've also wondered if, if, Joe, one of the things that you're bringing that's helping us um, when you're analyzing some of these arguments, not just the argument from limits, but other arguments you've been analyzing in your works, is you're, you're helping people to see other positions on the epistemic landscape. <laughs> Instead of saying, hey, those positions don't even exist because the argument refutes them all. They're not even really sort of real. And that's something that I, I, I can get very passionate about, actually, and I would want to join you in that project. Um, because I think we can just learn so much more if we can see each other on the epistemic landscape. So, so I don't want to sort of oversell the argument. But at the same time, I do want to say a little bit more about how I would sort of think about the, uh, this argument, the, the, the limits, like why do limits seem to call for an explanation, like in my own mind? And there are a few different reasons, but um, one of them, and, and maybe this is more for the audience than for you, Joe, because you've been swimming in my mind for a long time on this. But one of the considerations is just thinking about a relevant difference between one limit and another. Um, so for example, if I start thinking about the base of reality and I start imagining it having a certain shape, like let's say it's the shape of a pine cone or the shape of a cube. Um, simple shapes are easier. So let's say triangle, square, uh, you know, you go through these different shapes. When I think about the shapes, and this isn't sort of like obvious without actually doing this work of focusing my mind on the shapes and then considering the vertices and then thinking, hey, these vertices seem to be not relevantly different to account for why one of them would be fundamental and not the other. Um, I think this also kind of fits with a general call for an explanation from experience. So in experience, I witness things having a further explanation. And so maybe I have this principle of seeking the deepest explanation that I can by my lights. But I think I also have something that just convinces me with greater force. And it has to do with the irrelevant differences. Like really when I think about irrelevant differences, I find myself feeling like this is not just like a mere cost um, that's minor. Like this is like a huge cost to me. Um, from what I can tell, that fundamental reality, if it's fundamentally blue or fundamentally triangle or square, that just seems to me to be um, very hard to believe. <laughs> so, and it's because of those irrelevant differences. And there's a track record of explaining things further. So those are some of my thoughts about that. I know a lot of this is already quite familiar. Maybe all of it's familiar to you, but 
I'd love to hear any of your thoughts about that. Yeah. So, um, the three points you made, I, I agree with the first one. Definitely. Like, uh, like even granting this point, you know, it's, it's still helpful in that, um, if we grant that it's a cost or mark against the theory, at least in one respect, that it has fundamental limits, that itself is something that's you know significant in our assessment of the theories. So I agree with the first point, and the, as well as the third point, you know, helping people see other positions on the epistemic landscape. So I just wanted to mention the areas of, of agreement because we don't want to get mm -hmm. too lost in disagreement. Um, yeah. So the relevant difference point. I mean, one thing that I wonder about is. And again, I've got my oppie hat on. So um, maybe like the very fact that a theory which posits a fundamental limit does so well, we can suppose, you know, of course, by the by oppie's lights, it does so well with respect to simplicity and explanatory power, or at least better than the relevant theistic competitor theory. Maybe the very fact that his theory does well in these other regards gives him some reason to think that there's some relevant difference or other between uh -huh. the fundamental limit and other limits, even if he doesn't have that, uh, that relevant difference ready to hand, like ready to give you. Um, now, again, you might still think like, okay, all us being cool, we should prefer a theory that does have that, that explanation ready to hand. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, I'm not sure how strong that is. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, uh, I guess I, what do you think about that? Um, just like no, the very fact really, that really his nice theory. Point. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice point. It's a way of saying, in a way, it's not actually arbitrary in the way that we might have thought, because we have independent motivation for a theory that implies that there's going to be some explanation, even if we don't know what it is, for there being some limit. And even if we don't specify what that limit is, we just like leave open what the limit is. So we have independent reasons to think there's got to be some um, arbitrary, inexplicable, un un unexplained um, limit at the base of reality. And, and I think that that is, you know, an absolutely reasonable type of response um, to this kind of argument. And, and I, I think this then just comes back to weighing the sort of degrees of clarity in your own mind, right? So yeah, certainly, you know, this is, this is part of worldview construction. You know, this is why it kind of takes work, takes patience, takes other people, kind of help us to look at things. Um, I think for me, sometimes what will happen is I'll get almost like completely obsessed looking at one thing to get a lot of clarity. And then and I have to darken everything else out of my mind. I mean, this is both like a positive thing, but then also possibly like a negative thing. So I've got to darken everything out so that I can get that clarity so I can focus on that. And then once it's clear, okay, let's get the lights back on over here and see how those things fit. And it might be that once I get the lights back on, hey, there's something over here that's even clearer that overshadows what I was thinking over here. Um, and so I, I want to really acknowledge that point and then just say that kind of from my perspective, when I got very focused on these, these things over here, I started to get a feeling of clarity that this, this, this is just not fundamental reality. And not just because it doesn't seem to have the powers to produce the effects. I think that is a problem, but there's something about its particular shapes that just seemed to me to, to require some further explanation. But, you know, I could be wrong about that. And, and certainly there are other considerations um, that are very important to weigh in. So in that way, I feel like Api is serving the community when he's talking about taking your full theory, considering all the, you know, turning all the lights on. Um, like, absolutely, we need to do that. I think it's the only way really to make progress uh, on mm -hmm. these things. Yeah. So yeah. I think I just mostly want to acknowledge that point And then also just almost like confess that I, I have this sense that, there, there's going to be a deeper explanation. Um, and, and this is one of those things that I feel like has gotten quite clear to my mind when I think about particular limits like shapes. Now, there are others that maybe are less clear to my mind, but there are some where it's like colors, shapes, um, degrees of, of power, degrees of even value. Just seems like, well, why would it be marked off here rather than there? But there might be a deeper explanation. And I know in your notes, we have some possible deeper explanations that we can talk about or alternative theories as well. But that's just a little bit about kind of how I would motivate this sort of principle of explaining the limits. Um, I think maybe for, I, I've been wondering about this, Joe, and, and tell me what you think of this. I've been wondering if maybe like for a lot of people, if I make arguments from maybe a track record in experience with explanations of things, then you could sort of come up with the best explanation of the track record of experiences with explanations of things 
And maybe for a lot of people, that kind of an argument um, could be quite appealing. For whatever reason, and maybe this is just kind of my own limitations or whatever, but I find it like even more appealing to dim the lights on all the experiences and just think about those relevant differences. There's just something about that that just, I don't know, it, it's like thinking about those shapes, it's like the first principles of geometry. It's like, well, one of those principles seem to be that differences in vertices is not a relevant difference to being fundamental to all things. So that's kind of how it looks to me. Yeah. I mean, with respect to like the track record of explanation things, uh, I mean, I'm reminded of one of uh, Oppie's papers where I think it's called like, it's published a while back, but it's called something like uh, on different. No, I actually have the title up here. It's like, it's about defeasible reasoning and default principles. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So faulty reasoning, faulty reasoning about default principles and cosmological arguments. Was, this, faith was this with Coons? Was this with Robert yeah. Coons? I remember that yeah. dialogue. Yeah. 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 And Oppy was going through points that, um, you know, he gave the example of like a swan or something. And, you know, it's someone from the Northern Hemisphere who's pretty doubtful about the existence of black swans. Uh, they've heard some reports of them, but they're pretty skeptical and they give very little credence to the reports. And so um, we're in, they're in a dialogue between disagreeing parties. Uh, one of them is the, the Northerner, the Northern Hemisphere person, and they've only seen white swans. They've got this uh, generalization based on the white swans that they've seen. Uh, and uh, the, the disagreeing party is someone from the Southern Hemisphere who um, maybe hasn't seen a black swan themselves, but like knows a lot of people, maybe even their friends and so on, that they said that they've played with black swans and other sorts of things. Anyway, they give much more uh, credence to the testimonies of people seeing black swans. And so these two people are engaged in a, in a dialogue where they're disagreeing about whether or not the swan in the next room is white or black or whatever. Now, the person from the Southerner says uh, essentially something like, I mean, maybe like, I have some reason to think that this might be an exception to your generalization. Uh, because, you know, I just, I, I have some independent reason to think that there's that there may be a very there may very well be an exception here whereas the person who's giving the argument you know doesn't have that that independent reason and they're they're trying to urge making the the generalization and saying no it's it's definitely white and then the other person is saying well, like no uh, i don't accept your generalization i don't accept it to this case because i have some independent reason in this yeah. in this other instance now i'm kind of you know oppie's point is situated in a different a slightly different mm -hmm. dialectic and i'm kind of slightly modifying points but um but it does I mean, that, that's just something yeah yeah, it does apply here. And I'm just trying to get my Oppie hat on and thinking how Oppie would respond. Just a general point for the audience before I turn it back over to you, Josh. Um, like when you're evaluating arguments and you're doing these sorts of things, try to really put on the hat of someone who disagrees with you. Like put on the hat, uh, like think to yourself, what would Graham Oppie say about this? Or what would, uh, if you're an atheist, what would someone like Josh Rasmussen or Alex Proust, like what would they say about this? How would they respond? Um, so that's a really good tool for analyzing arguments. You'd really try to intellectually empathize with your opponent and really see how they would respond. Um, so, I mean, that's why I, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a naturalist, but I'm, I'm trying to put on my Oppie and naturalist hat and seeing, you know, given my experience with Oppie's work and, you know, even working with him personally on things, uh, I'm trying to push as far as I can uh, Oppie and lines. So, so, yeah. Yeah, I was about to say, but Joe, I am a naturalist of sorts. <laughs> uh, by naturalist, what you mean is a worldview that's incompatible with whatever the target conclusion is of the argument from arbitrary limits. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, so those are great points. And um, and, and I actually have those similar reservations that Oppie would raise with respect to a kind of defeasible version of um, this principle of explaining limits. I think the defeasible version is one where you say, you know, explain the limits as far as you can, but then maybe you have some independent reason to um, not explain further. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that that defeasible version can't have value for somebody. It just means it's not the sort of final chip, right? And, um, and then as far as the kind of argument from uniformity, I mean, I talked with Api about the kind of uniformity principle, and he seemed kind of skeptical of that particular principle, that the, the limits would be uniformly um, having an explanation. Um, and so, you know, fair enough, right? Because if, the light of reason sort of enters your mind and stimulates um, a sense that something's true, then maybe that's information for you. But if it enters your mind and doesn't stimulate that sense, well, then immediately, as long as I know about somebody who has a different perspective on something that I'm looking at, 
that's going to make me curious. And so this, I think, speaks to your nice point about going to the other person's perspective, because maybe what's going on is that um, the other person is sort of looking at it in a closer way or in a different way. And if I can enter their perspective, it's going to help me see that I'm not really seeing what I think I'm seeing. And this has happened to me you know, many times over. And there are even angles of this very argument where something like this has happened um, in, t- farther down in one of the later premises, well, which we'll get to, which has helped me to sort of clarify some things in my own mind. So, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a nice point. So I think we've, you know, uh, traversed this dialectic sufficient for present purposes for like the oppie points. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe we, I, I do kind of want to get onto this number three in the document. I think it's interesting to explore. Uh, so basically, I've been thinking a lot as of late about responses to cosmological arguments that mount parity arguments that use similar causal principles, but the causal yeah. principles are un- unfriendly to theism, right? Um, so Felipe Leon does this in, I think, even your dialogue book with him. And, you know, you ultimately are like, okay, well, let's just, let's grant that principle and I can develop a panentheism, but okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that soon. But mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the basic idea is that you have a cosmological argument which has a, a causal or an explanatory principle, and then allegedly at the end you are getting to God's existence. The idea of the parity argument is that you mount a different causal principle or an explanatory principle that's motivated in much the same way. Things like yeah. induction and abduction and intuition and relevant differences and so on, but which subserves an argument that ultimately concludes to God's non-existence, or at least the, the falsity of traditional theism, like creation ex nihilo, et cetera. So like one of these might be about um, material causality, right? You might think, uh, you know, your principle is that um, limits, let, let me see, it's like that limits are yeah, limits are explained. So then you might yeah. think that uh, material objects are materially causally explained. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that there are, for any material object that you pick, there are some things or stuff from which it is made. As a, So that, like, it has a material cause in that sense. Now, you know, you might like, that's uniformly attested to in our experience. We've never witnessed a material object uh, that, that doesn't have, that doesn't, come from some pre-existent things or stuff, uh, you might think of relevant differences, like mere differences in size. Like uh, if I take this pen and I make it the size of the universe, it's not as though it could exist without coming from some pre-existent things or stuff like the plastic and et cetera. Yeah. Um, you might think size and shape are irrelevant. Like, so there doesn't seem to be a relevant difference between different material objects, which could account for why some of them require material causes, but other ones don't. We've got this track record of things, of material objects, uh, having material causes, etc. And so we, in much the same way that the causal principle is supported, we get support for alternative causal principles. But of course, if that principle is true, then apply it to whatever material object that God created first, or maybe whatever is the largest material object, maybe the universe or something like that. And it's going to have to follow that it was created out of some prior things or stuff as a material cause. Uh, And at least under traditional theism, which affirms creation ex nihilo, there are no pre-existent things or stuff from which the universe is made. Uh, And so... I mean, of course, the theist could still accept this and, you know, adopt panentheism, where uh, God creates out of the resources of his own being, as it were, creation ex deus, or, uh, yeah, but at least it, it pushes on traditional theism. And, you know, we could also get into, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you in a second, Josh, don't worry, but we, you could also get into, like, just traditional theism, or, like, just theism as such, excuse me, principles that are such that if they were true, they would be in tension with theism as such, and not just traditional theism, so... Um, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll just, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think I just want to underline the the structure of, of your point here, which is which is that um, if the same sort of considerations and support of a principle leading to a conclusion, we sort of equally support a principle that is in competition with that conclusion, um, then in a way we, we've undercut the support for the original. We need some kind of symmetry breaker. And that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, what, what, I say, what can I say about that? I mean, that that's correct. Um, and so then uh, to me, this invites me to have a close look at, okay, what are the competing principles? What are the competing supports? And so that's kind of, an, in a way, an open project, um, you know? So I think there are symmetry principles that may affect certain worldviews in ways that don't affect other worldviews, as you pointed out, in terms of different ways in which fundamental reality may relate to non-fundamental reality. Um, I think one sort of maybe personality difference um, between me and, and 
some other possible people. <laughs> okay. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, but maybe it, there's a personality that, that I have where I get very curious about like, like what, what is fundamental reality by all the tools that I have. And I'm not like thinking about a theistic theory in particular, if that makes sense. I, I'm just sort of like thinking about, okay, does it have some capacity? Does it have some value? Does it have, and then can I remove the arbitrary limits? And then like, what happens after that? And then if somebody says, hey, here's a parallel argument that leads to, you know, this sort of problem with that theological model of the foundational reality, that's like, okay, well, that's interesting. Well, that gives me more information now um, because, uh, you know, maybe what that means is that fundamental reality is related to the effects in a way that's consistent with this other principle, right? Then we just have to look at the details of the principles. Um, so I, I think that's all I really want to say about that here. I mean, unless there's something more specific that you want to bring up here, but I think this is, it's a nice I, structural point. Yeah. I mean, I honestly just want to, I mean, I'm kind of just wanting to give people conceptual tools to think about this argument and they might not have heard of an objection like that. And just at least putting that on their radar and making them aware that such objections exist, that there is this problem of alternative causal principles, which if they were true, they might pose problems for traditional theism. I think it's just a good tool that people can have in their toolkit, whether or not they agree with it. Uh, it's just a good tool, just because they might not have been aware of it before this. So, I mean, that's a side thing that I like about these sorts of conversations is that I can help people see other positions on the epistemic landscape, literally your third point that you made. I mean, that's just one of my biggest goals for my channel. And just yeah. anyway, I just wanted to say that. I appreciate okay. that, Joe. I, I can tell that you, you have not only the philosopher's DNA, but also obviously the teacher's DNA as well. <laughs> like you want people to understand more and that's that's really great um so I, I feel that even as we're talking you're thinking about the audience and and so yeah i want to definitely join you on that um point that structural point i think that's right mm -hmm. um i'm curious to hear what else you want to talk about in terms of the later steps of the argument here yeah yeah um so how about we go yeah we could talk about platonism and trinitarianism later maybe um okay. Yep. at the end when because you know that's sort of your stuff later under the objection thing okay so yeah. um so then let's go to premise four um so okay so just for the audience to remind them um premise one is you know again assuming that there's a fundamental reality and then premise two is that limits are explained right and remember since being fundamental means in part being unexplained well then fundamental reality if it's going to have a degree of greatness it's not going to be limited, right? Because if it had a degree of greatness and it were limited, then it would have an explanation. But remember, fundamental reality doesn't have an explanation. Okay, so that's a conclusion three. Conclusion three is that if n has a degree of greatness, then its greatness is not arbitrarily or inexplicably limited. Okay, then in order to get that it's, in order to infer from that that its greatness is not arbitrarily or inexplicably limited, you have to add that n does indeed have some greatness, right? Yeah. And I guess, at least right now, before talking to you, and this could, I could this could totally change. Uh, I'm not sure about this, this premise that N has some greatness. Um, to me, maybe N is just thoroughly axiologically neutral, as I put it. Uh, it's it's not great. It's not bad. It's just it's just neutral. Uh, like intuitively, uh, let me just speak for myself. Intuitively, I don't really see like a foundational quantum field, say, or like foundational particles or mariological simples or the universal wave function or pri the priority monist universe or <laughs> Oppie's initial singularity. I don't see these things intuitively. If we're construing them as not minded and impersonal, uh, I don't really see them as great or valuable in any way. And I've kind of been toying with the idea that only minded things can have greatness. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that's so, then for me, settling whether n has greatness, and so settling whether this premise is true, seems to me to depend on settling whether n is minded and at least yet not yet i mean i'm not really convinced that n is minded so i give some examples of this like just consider like electrons like intuitively i don't think they have any greatness like even if they have power even if they have more power than the number one like is an electron greater than the number one i i don't have that intuition i'm sorry mm -hmm. i confess to that i confess yeah. that i don't have the intuition that electrons are greater than the number one uh, <laughs> And the intuition remains even when I ascribe attributes to the mindless and impersonal foundation, things like necessary existence, fundamentality, being the source of everything else. To me, those in some sense confer greatness, but only when they're conferred to like a minded being, a minded mm -hmm. being that's necessarily existent, that's in the intentional source of all. That seems to be better, <laughs> but um, that seems to be great making. But like if it's just like this impersonal wave function or something or like a particle like or a, si a singularity, I, ju I just don't see it. Um, 
So, so yeah, I mean, that's one reservation for this, this fourth premise. Yeah, good. So Joe, you know, that feeling that you have sometimes if you're seeing uh, an argument and then you have this itch to like talk about it. Well, I have that feeling about this. I'm so glad that we could talk about this part of the argument because there have been these um, presentations that I've, I've seen of this argument from arbitrary limits that point to the value of saying something more about why fundamental reality would have some value. And so I, and I itch just to talk about it a little bit because in, in my book, How Reason Can Lead a God, um, that's the book uh, where this argument from limits, uh, well, this classical version comes from. And in that book, I take four chapters to argue that fundamental reality would be minded. And, and part of the reason why I'm doing that is to make an argument that it would have some value uh, by, by the very point that you're making, which is that if it has some kind of mentality, there's something about mentality that um, is connected to having value. I want to say a little bit more about what I mean by value. I have a whole chapter in the book on, on value, but, um, but besides those, those four different arguments, um, and, and one can of course analyze each one of those arguments and raise objections to each one of them, obviously, of course, but, but they're, I'm sort of thinking about them as like pieces to fill in to this argument from arbitrary limits. And, um, if, if there, if, if this isn't filled in, then of course, I'm going to join you in saying, Hey, there's a gap here in the argument. We need something else to see why it would have some value. Um, but there, but in addition to those four arguments I also have a, a fifth point. Oh, and just kind of briefly in, in the book, the arguments are from explaining the configuration of matter. So I've got an argument on, on fine tuning, um, explaining mind itself. So an argument from consciousness, um, thinking about morality and thinking about what th these are probabilistic arguments. So these aren't necessarily deductive arguments, but thinking about how mind might play a role in explaining morality and uh, the emergence of a kind of moral landscape. And then I also have a chapter on reasoning and mathematics and how that could also point to a fundamental mentality in different ways. But sweep all of those to the side. There's a fifth idea that I have, which is that there's something valuable about having the power to produce value. And my thought that is that if the fundamental reality is sort of the original power behind all powers, including um, if powers to produce value, then there's something on the axiological dimension um, just because it, it can sort of produce value. Now, there are things that one could say about that in response, but I just want to note that there are those pieces that are relevant to this point to think about. And then just if I could add a note here about what I mean by value, because some people can be sort of thinking like, well, isn't value purely subjective? Um, doesn't your argument require that there's some kind of objective value? And those words, subjective and objective, they're kind of slippery terms. But one analysis of value that I offer is that something has a kind of value, and I'd rather use the term intrinsic value, if one can like it for its own sake. So like, for example, uh, maybe there's a state of like happiness and that state of happiness could be liked um, or desired uh, for its own sake for the kind of thing it is and my, my thought is that or, or you could just think of it as basic there's like an intrinsic value and there's no further analysis but sometimes i like to offer the possibility of this analysis um, in terms of what one could like for its own sake because i think it does kind of pull on some of those intuitions about the subjectivity side of value um, so maybe there is this kind of subjectivity side even of intrinsic value the intrinsic has to do with like what it is so I'm, I'm liking the knowledge for its own sake i'm liking that um feeling of love for its own sake i'm liking you joe you know just because of the kind of being you are right <laughs> for your own sake um and so my thought is that if if there is this concept of value and for for some people this concept of value is already going to be it's not going to fit well into the worldview and later that's okay because later i have other versions of the argument from arbitrary limits that might that you might still be able to use um, through power or through existence or through other attributes. But here, just highlighting that, yes, like there is a need to fill in this piece of the argument to try to highlight why fundamental reality would have some value. And my thought has been that, well, it would have some value in virtue of its abilities to be a foundation for things like mind, matter, uh, morals, and um, just other valuable things. Um, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. And I'm curious if, 
what kind of what you think about that, if you feel like that helps to fill that in or um, if you have other objections to that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you for, for all those responses. That's really good. Um, I think there's, yeah, so three main points there. So the first, the first one was basically one way that you could go is recognizing, yeah, okay, uh, I'm going to have to show in some manner that um, N is minded in some way. And then, and you know, you, you know, you adumbrated your four arguments uh, in your book. And then, yeah, I mean, so that's just one way to go. Um, I, Josh, I know you're not like this, but you know, I, I am very, uh, shall we say sensitive to people triumphalistically putting arguments forward, uh, you know, and, and chest thumping and these sorts of things. And, you know, just basically saying, you know, this argument establishes theism, you know, this stage two case proves, you know, like I'm very sensitive to that. And so if like what I want to emphasize to the audience or to people who are inclined to that sort of thinking is I just want to like, I just want to point out that like, it's, this isn't rationally inescapable. Like you have to rely on these other arguments, like this first move, you have to rely on these other arguments in order to show that it's minded. I, I just want to say, like, I want to push back on behalf of people who aren't convinced of the argument and just like, mm -hmm. at least just make it known, just make them heard that, uh, this argument itself by itself, you'd need to append some further assumption, like that the foundation is minded or that N is minded. And maybe you have some independent arguments for that, but it's this, again, it, this argument alone is not going to take you, uh, to theism unless you append it with something like, uh, a premise or an assumption that this thing is minded. I, I know, again, you're not, you're not, you're not one of these people who are <laughs> triumphalistically propounding this argument. But, but others do, and I just want to like speak on behalf of the people who I almost see as like the oppressed. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's weird, but um, you know, there are the oppressors, mm -hmm. and we all, we all fall into this mindset, but there are the oppressors who use the arguments as weapons, and they attack others, and they say, this proves my conclusion. Um, and you know, sometimes the oppressed, the people who are subjects of that, uh, sometimes they don't have the conceptual resources, the conceptual tools to be able to push back on those arguments. They feel threatened. They, they're backed into a corner and they don't, maybe they don't even, they haven't studied decades of philosophy. So they're, uh, they're not able to like pick apart certain assumptions of the argument. And I, I want to serve them and help them mm. help the oppressed, help them say, no, yeah. actually these arguments do have certain gaps. Here's a yeah. gap that needs to be filled. And that, that argument that they gave just that argument alone doesn't fill that gap. So I don't know, I'm just very passionate about these sorts of tricky dialectics and helping people see that, you know, like, hey, this assumption, this gap in the argument needs either independent reasoning or, you know, something like that. And I just think that there's something valuable in that. So, I mean, that's one thing that I, I, love I that. just wanted to say. Yeah. yeah, I love that so much about about you, Joe. And, and that and every one of those other arguments, there are rational lines out of those other arguments, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because I think sometimes people maybe are kind of like fighting for similar things, but in ways that injure the other side a little bit. So sometimes I think um, I, I've seen two sides of this. So one, one side is some, sometimes I have the sense that maybe people are presenting certain arguments um, from the problem of evil against theism as a way of almost like showing, hey, you know what, like we actually do have some kind of rational basis here for our beliefs. And then same thing for the theists. So theists are presenting some arguments for theism, almost in response to uh, people almost like accusing them of, hey, you're not rational. You, you don't even care about reason. You just want to believe that. And so then they're presenting the arguments almost to defend and protect themselves. But then what happens is that the very presentation, if it's triumphal, it begins to feel like now it's actually oppressing, as you put it, others who are saying, hey, you know what, I'm just trying to protect my rationality over here. <laughs> and so both sides are trying to protect their own rationality, which is why I, I just find it so helpful and so liberating to think of arguments from kind of a first person perspective and just to ask myself, like kind of by my lights, where can this lead me without presuming that it should lead others in the same way. In fact, I can invite others to sort of help me check my steps. I feel like even in this conversation, it's like, okay, hey, help, help me, Joe, check my steps. And, and you've done this over the years and you've helped me see things that I didn't see without your help. And so I very much value that. But then that feels so different if I'm saying, hey, here's something that kind of makes sense to me. And the conclusion of this argument, given my current state of limitation, is that I have some reason to think the conclusion is true. It does not mean that 
people who don't think the conclusion is true, uh, you know, that they necessarily, all of them have some reason to think that. And insofar as I might communicate that, I might stir up some resistance. And some of that resistance might come back to me in the form of, hey, that argument is dialectically toothless. Well, maybe it is in the sense that it doesn't bite all of the uh, people who disagree with it, right? <laughs> but um, so I, I love that about you, Joe. And I, I feel like I've seen some of your videos and I thought, oh, okay, you're doing work that I had wanted to do with my channel. And it almost gives me a certain freedom to almost like let go of some of that because we're sort of on a, on a common team. And so I think that's that's great um, pointing, pointing that out. So e even right. this argument for a foundational mind goes through these other complex territories. But I do want to highlight that there's this fifth idea, which is kind of part of my classic line, uh, which doesn't go through the mind first. It rather has a more um, kind of abstract argument that to get value later in the scene of reality, um, there's going to be some power and that power is going to have value. And then my that thought was the is point that, that I was just going to mention. Yeah, good. So so let's go there then, because that OK, that's um, that's a different kind of argument as well. Yeah. So yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So the basic idea here is that having the power to produce value is itself valuable or maybe um, as you put it in the notes, because I'm not sure we should be, I mean, speaking in terms of power to produce kind of biases this in towards of in terms of causation, whereas we're leaving it open, whether or not the relation is one of grounding or something like that. So, um, or just mere explanation. So as you put it in the notes, um, you know, you said something along the lines of it takes greatness to make greatness, or it takes value to make value, or it takes value to ground or explain value. And I guess I had a few responses or thoughts on that yeah. um, as a different way of supporting this this uh, fourth premise that N has some greatness. One of them is like, at least right now, and not having talked to you further, uh, I don't share the intuition behind the greatness principle, as we can call it. Let's just call this a greatness principle. It takes greatness to yeah. make greatness, or it takes value to make value. I guess, at least right now, I don't share the intuition. And I recognize that my intuitions can change after talking to people, right? So that's why I say, at least now, I have to index it to a time because future in the future, I could share the intuition. Okay, so uh, right now, I don't share the intuition. I guess I just don't see why greatness couldn't be grounded in non-greatness. I, I guess I just, I just don't really... I just don't see it. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, it doesn't take, I, this is, this was a playful example, but it doesn't take sponginess to make sponginess, right? Um, you have various ingredients that are not themselves spongy, like the flour and the eggs and the sugar and the milk and the, the heat from the oven. Uh, but from that bada bing, bada boom, you get, you get sponginess, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't take sponginess to make sponginess. You can get sponginess from things that are not spongy. So I guess I just don't really see why you can't get some like greatness aspects from some more fundamental layer or aspects that are not themselves great or greatness involving. Um, uh -huh. So that's one thing is just not sharing the intuition. Uh, and then I guess another thing that I wanted to say is, I don't know if this is a good counterexample. I don't even know if it succeeds as a counterexample. I'm just saying that at the beginning, I'm not claiming to have refuted the principle. <laughs> I just, I think this is interesting and I just want to test it with you, Josh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think knowledge is intrinsically great, right? But like mm -hmm. knowledge is grounded in individual components that, aren't themselves great? I mean, like belief, uh, that there being a fact of the matter, um, you may be having certain considerations that support your having that belief. And then finally, your beliefs being relevantly explanatorily connected to the fact. I think that's a reasonable analysis of knowledge. We don't have to get into Gettier cases. Um, but I think that's a reasonable analysis of knowledge. Uh, and I think knowledge is like sort of grounded in these more fundamental components. Someone has knowledge because they satisfy these, let's say these four components. Um, and I mean, that seems to be a case of getting greatness from non-greatness. Like you, from these components that aren't themselves great, you get knowledge and the knowledge is itself great. Now, again, like mm -hmm. maybe you'll say that the components only ground the knowledge. They don't ground the greatness of the knowledge, right? So there's, there's a distinction between grounding the knowledge versus grounding the greatness that the knowledge has. Yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, one of my thoughts in response to that point was like, I mean, presumably knowledge is great because of like what it is to be knowledge because of the intrinsic character or nature of knowledge. Uh, and then that in turn is going to at least, I think that that intrinsic nature, nature or character of knowledge depends on those four components, um, which aren't themselves 
great. I mean, we can talk about whether or not beliefs are great, but again, like I can probably give it further story if you, you say that those are great. Like, oh, well, what it is to have a belief is to, you know, I could tell some story that doesn't involve greatness. Um, so I wonder, those are sort of two responses that I that I have here. Um, man, okay, I'm sorry, Josh. One third response. No, this is and really, really good. Joe, yeah, this there's, is there's so one good. I yeah, yeah, go ahead. There's a Please third go. response in the document. So the first response is not showing the intuition. The second response is potential counterexamples. I don't know if they succeed. I truly don't know, Josh. Um, and then the third one is uh, from conceivability. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I take myself to be able to conceive of there being a being whose greatness is limited and whose limit in greatness flows from some like simple qualitative non-greatness involving fundamental trope. There's, you know, mm -hmm. trope theory is this huge thing in metaphysics and so on. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I can at least conceive of it being true. And I can conceive of there being like a fundamental being and this fundamental being, yeah, it has limits in greatness, uh, but those sort of flow from uh, this, this just qualitatively simple trope. And that simple trope is like not itself great or greatness involving, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I take myself to be able to coherently conceive of that. So I guess those are three reasons. Again, for the audience, one of them is I don't seem to share the intuition behind the greatness principle. Uh, secondly, there might be counterexamples to the greatness principle. And thirdly, it, you know, the, what, what leads me to be very uh, suspicious of the principles that I'm able to con coherently conceive of, you know, greatness of, of the falsity of this greatness principle. And I think that the greatness principle would be necessarily true of true at all. So, um, so yeah. That, that's really good. Very clear. I actually want to come back to that third one because it's related to some thoughts I have on the Trinity objections, plural. There's different versions of this. So we'll come back to that. Um, and and I, I love those first two. It, I have this picture of what we're doing here is we're looking very, very closely at this territory. I don't know why I have this like this picture of us in a forest. I don't know why. And like we're looking down at these conceptual leaves and Joe is picking up a leaf and he's saying, Josh, look at this. And then and then I'm trying to figure out, is that the same leaf I was looking at over here? Because Joe's describing it this way. Maybe it is the same leaf. I, I was thinking about your video on intuitions. And one of the points you make on that video, which I thought was just a great point, is that sometimes it looks like people have different intuitions, but what's going on is that they also have different propositional contents that might be subtly different. Um, and one thing that I've, I've found is that through conversations, Sometimes we think that we have the same proposition in mind because we're using the same words, but every word has a cluster of concepts associated with it. And we might not have precisely the same proposition in mind. So in the notes, um, I have this greatness principle. And, and I realize like kind of for the audience, we're deep in now. We're really focusing in on some minute things and we're almost losing the forest for the trees and the leaves inside. But we almost have to do this kind of analytical surgery to get some clarity. And so this is what I was anticipating uh, would happen, which is great that we would kind of move past some of the um, packages of our thinking and then get into this kind of exploration mode together. Um, and it's, it is very precise. So what I, what I have in the notes here, uh, I had the kind of rough greatness principle and the greatness principle is relevant to understanding uh, why fundamental reality might have any kind of positive aspect at all. It's also relevant to understanding something in relation to the Trinity objections, which I'm going to just come back to. So I'm going to bracket that for now. But, um, but I had a kind of rough and ready statement of it that it takes greatness to make greatness. Now we can get some more detail into what that statement is. Um, and so I have a, a little bit more of a precise statement of this where I say if P is positive, a property P is positive. And by positive, I mean it's, it's value or greatness entailing. And by that, I mean, it's the kind of property that entails is or entails a property that um, could be liked for what it is. So like knowledge or love or um, the power to produce knowledge. You might think that, that there's something positive about that because of what it entails. And so the principle I have is that if P is positive in that sense and it's grounded in Q, then Q is also positive. Okay. Now, I, I don't know, because even Joe, when you were bringing up the example of knowledge being based on more fundamental things that maybe aren't themselves value entailing, um, it was kind of making me think about the person who has the knowledge or the mind or the being that has the knowledge. And I was thinking that, well, even if we sort of just grant for sake of argument that there's some positive state that can be in some way grounded in some states that are valueless, um, it's still that that whole episode 
maybe depends on something that has value. And, and I think maybe for me, the clear intuition that I had was more like, like if, if reality ever just was completely devoid of all positive aspects, um, then it would like never roll into something that has positive aspects because the very potential to roll into something that has positive aspects is itself a positive aspect. Um, there's something valuable about that. And then maybe that implies that it's minded because you know may, maybe you're right. Maybe the only way that it would have value is if it's mental. Perhaps you've seen this article um, about, I think it's called Panormism, but yeah. this article like is value, about- Like value all the way down, basically. Yeah, it, it's making this kind of argument that it's related to this kind of greatness principle. And I realize there's different ways of unpacking this. So this would be maybe a longer, longer conversation to think about together, how we could clarify different versions, separate them out. Um, but one could make this argument that there is value at the base of reality based on some kind of uh, principle that value depends on some prior value. And then add your premise that value implies mindedness. And this would be like an, a different route to get to fundamental mindedness. So you don't have to argue for the mind and then argue the mind has value. You argue for the fundamental value and then you say, but it wouldn't have fundamental value if it didn't have a mind. Um, this is a very thin and abstract line. I'm not thinking that this is necessarily like the most persuasive of all the lines, but I do find it very interesting just to think about. And so I would be kind of curious to hear from you, like, what do you think about the idea that if we sort of clarify different versions of this greatness principle and we focus more specifically on the principle that if it's greatness entailing or value entailing and it's grounded in something, then that thing that it's grounded in would also be value entailing. Or is that the thing that you would kind of want to want to question that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was sort of, at least as I was conceiving of it, I was sort of, I was having that at least a principle that's synonymous with that principle in mind, because you defined okay. uh, greatness earlier as, you know, I think it was something like um, uh, greatness entailing, it either is or entails greatness or something along those lines. Um, and yeah, I was thinking of just general explanation, but I mean, also in terms of grounding, I, I just find myself, I find myself not having the intuition. I mean, okay, so let me say that I, I can definitely understand how someone could have that intuition, mm -hmm. like, you know, sometimes, sometimes when I don't have an intuition on something, I really do struggle to see how some, some people could have the intuition. I'm like, okay. how are you seeing that? Like, <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder that, um, mm -hmm. uh, while still recognizing, you know, that they see it, um, <coughs> I'm still wondering how Th this is not one where I wonder, like, how could someone see this, you know? So, um, just wanted to, to emphasize that, but I guess I'm just currently not really seeing that one. Um, and you know, it takes reflection. It takes thinking about these things and so on. I just, and maybe it's like a mixture of the conceivability plus the, um, plus these other considerations that are making it difficult for me to, I, I honestly don't know, but I guess that's still my verdict here. It's like, I, I guess I'm not quite seeing it yet. Um, but what I'm totally the, open to it. Yeah. What, what about that? That's totally fair. Um, what about just having the capacity to produce valuable states? Would that capacity have some kind of value in your mind? Uh, so is this an iterated capacity? I mean, like, uh, like, um, you know, like Josh, or, no, um, Graham Oppie's initial singularity. I mean, does it, <laughs> does that yeah, have the capacity to, that. yeah. So, I mean, it has the capacity to produce a succeeding state, which has, which itself has the capacity to produce a succeeding state, which has the capacity to produce a succeeding state, which is such that in a few billion years, you know, yeah. maybe there'll be some things with value. So in, in that sense, I guess the initial singularity has the capacity to produce value. Um, I'm like, what's so good about that? Like, I don't, I don't really, <laughs> I'm, I'm just struggling to see how well, that without makes it, there would be no learning. value. There'd be no value if it, it. if it didn't have the capacity to be a head or a foundation for some value later in the sequence, if it didn't have that, there'd be no value. And, uh, that's part of what makes it ha valuable that, that it allows there to be value in the world. I, I don't know that do you have yeah, any kind one of plus intuition one. there? Yeah. I mean, like without one plus one equaling two, nothing would be valuable, but is one plus one two valuable or something like that? I mean, that's a necessary condition on, I mean, all necessary truths are necessary conditions on, on things being uh, valuable, but I don't really see all necessary truths as valuable. Um, truths, I said I'm that weird. Uh, yeah. 
So, I mean, that's a necessary condition without which there would be no value, but I don't really see those as being valuable. I guess that's my point. So, yeah. Well, so well, they, this will be interesting when we get to the say, other. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say, um, there is one point on premise six. So, Josh, what we could do is um, yeah. we could we could just table this point. We could go on to premise six where I make that, that one point about uh, the inference from not limited to perfect. And then yeah. we could go on to the Trinity because I know we wanted to talk about that. Um, that and I'm fine great. with going over an hour and a half because I'm having a lot of fun with this conversation. Yeah, let's do and that. I, I'm really liking this. So, um, okay. So um, from all the preceding premises from one through four, you get five that ends greatness is not arbitrarily limited. And then premise six says, if ends greatness is not arbitrarily limited, then N is perfect in at least some sense. Yeah. Okay, so again, premise six for the audience, it says, if n's greatness is not arbitrarily limited, then n is in some sense perfect. I guess, uh, and again, this is prior to talking to you because I could become convinced of this, but I guess at least antecedently, I found myself skeptical of this. Um, what, I, what, I, what I was thinking when I, when I wrote this point about being skeptical of this is that perhaps n's greatness is far below perfect, and so it's limited to like a non-maximal extent, but it's not inexplicably limited. Uh, and so it's not arbitrarily limited. So like maybe N's limit in greatness is explained in terms of the metaphysical necessity of N's having such a limit in greatness, or perhaps uh, N's limit in greatness is explained in terms of what it is to be N. Uh, what it is to be N is in part to have that sort of non-maximal extent of greatness. I mean, that's a very popular essentialist style explanation of things as features, uh, mm -hmm. of things as having certain essential features um, in like metaphysics and so on. Like what it is to be water is to be H2O. Um, there is a, uh, I mean, yeah, anyway, um, I'm not gonna, not gonna belabor that point, but yeah, I mean, I want, what do you think about that? Uh, do you think that ends greatness or what do you think about my skepticism here based on, on these sorts of considerations? Yeah, I think it definitely invites um, some further clarification, which I was kind of thinking that clarification could be displayed as I kind of talk through my analysis of the Trinity objections, because I think that the Trinity objections kind of point to the same kind of structure of the worry, which is that you could get a foundational explanation that in a sense um, grounds or explains certain limits with respect to greatness so that it wouldn't be perfect. Um, but it, it could be very limited, very, very constrained by something more fundamental. So I wonder if maybe what I could do here is just talk through that Trinity objection and then offer some of my thoughts. Some of my thoughts support what you're saying. And then some of my thoughts go on to add another piece that I think can maybe clarify a little bit what's at stake. Does that sound good for a plan? That's that's totally cool. I just wanted to at least put that. I mean, like yeah. like I said, like I'm I'm hoping to put these things on the radar for people because I want to speak up, as it were, for the oppressed. Um, honestly, <laughs> those are feel those who are feeling like um, the apologists not oppressed by taking you. my argument and try to say, hey, you guys have to believe this. Is that <laughs> that there's ways out? There's there's freedom here, right? Um, yeah. So did you were you going to say something here? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I just wanted to say, like, again, I, I don't think of, of you as, as doing that. I just wanted to emphasize that. It's uh, just, you know, oftentimes, and again, I fall into, I fall into these traps as well. You know, like I, uh, I sometimes become the oppressor, but, you know, it's a constant effort to fight against that and to try to cultivate um, these sorts of intellectual virtues. So, yeah. Yeah. To be aware of that dynamic is so helpful. So I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, well, let me just say, when I first heard of the Trinity objection, I found myself in resistance to it because I felt like it didn't really, it, it, I had this sort of picture of um, somebody playing on a different chessboard and then saying, hey, your chess opening fails because of what I'm doing over here. And then my response is like, but wait, 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 that does not touch my argument. But then through further reflection and through conversation, um, I think that I was able to sort of see how what the Trinity objection is doing is it's pointing to a structure of reasoning that it's very valuable to display the structure reasoning and to draw it into light and then to analyze it. So this is why in my notes, I've got two different uh, versions of the Trinity objection. So the first, I call it the dialectical version. The dialectical version goes like this. Um, some of the people who like this argument from limits for a foundational perfect being, okay, they also think that this foundational perfect being is tripersonal, triune, 
Um, and, and maybe they think this through revelation, through tradition, through uh, various reasons. And so by, their, by the light of their own worldview, they already think that God has some limits with respect to the number of people um, built into the fabric of God or the foundation, okay? And this is a kind of a dialectical um, objection because it doesn't really target any premise in this formulation of the argument. Now, I realize there are other formulations of the argument, so maybe it does target a premise in, in another formulation. And that and that's very fair, absolutely very fair. Um, and so it's dialectical because it's inviting the person who thinks that God is triune to, to um, think about, well, do you still like Rasmussen's argument? You, you've got to choose, you know, stick with your theology, um, but you can't have both. You can't have your cake and eat it too, okay? So that's the dialectical um, objection. And my response here is, is really just to clarify, and, and this is, you, you know this very well, Joe, is just to clarify that when I'm looking for a fundamental reality that doesn't have arbitrary limits, I'm, I'm looking for limits that have no deeper explanation. And somebody might have some reason to think that there is a deeper explanation for certain kind of limited structures within fundamental reality. So somebody might have some independent reason for that. Um, but this is not sort of the, the last word on this argument because there's a second version of the Trinity objection. And I call this a, the structural objection. And this objection goes like this, says, if limits in God can have a deeper explanation, then limits in a natural foundation, which doesn't qualify as God, um, could also in the same way have a deeper explanation. So if a theist can say, hey, you know what? My God has various limits, but they're explained by something deeper then the naturalist who's not a theist uh, could say the same thing. Um, and the, the first thing I wanna say about this is actually, I think this also highlights the way in which you can think of the argument from arbitrary limits more as a tool to probe by the light of your own worldview. So for example, William Lane Craig, he sent me an email uh, a few months ago about this argument. And he was asking me kind of what I thought about how it fits with a, a triune conception of God. And on his view, his understanding of the Trinity is that it doesn't have a, a deeper explanation. And, or at least he didn't want to be committed to that. And so then he was wondering if he could still make use of the argument. And I said, well, you could still make use of the general idea of reducing arbitrariness like as far as you can. So like to illustrate this, imagine you have some independent reason to think that there's a brute fact in reality that's foundational, and then you see a fire. Well, the reason to think that there's a brute fact doesn't give you a reason to think that the fire is also a brute fact. So the idea here is that um, you can still explain things as far as you can and reduce arbitrariness as far as you can. And so the way that then Craig was using the argument was that of, um, he has no independent reason to think that the greatness of fundamental reality has to have some kind of arbitrary limit or boundary. So he's okay with thinking of the greatness as maximal um, because it's not part of his worldview to, um, to think there has to be a limit there, okay? So I just wanna make that note, but having made that note, I wanna go back to supporting the objection against uh, the argument, uh, the, the limits argument. And what I have in my notes here is that Suppose the greatness in fundamental reality is limited by some more basic property, call it X, then perhaps this fundamental reality could be imperfect. That is, it's not the greatest kind of thing that could be because of its having X. And so if there can be something that explains why God has a limited number of persons, somebody could think maybe for reasons, you know, that I could speculate, maybe I have reasons, maybe I don't, but maybe as far as the argument goes, um, there could be sort of a fundamental nature that precludes God's perfection, okay? And I feel like that's a very important kind of objection. And what I have in my notes is kind of my original response to this, which I still think there's value to my original response. And I wanna to point to it, I'm kind of itching to point to it because I think sometimes this original response has been left out of some of the um, critiques I've seen out there floating out there in the ether. Um, so I want to point to that, but then I also want to beat up on my original response, response again, and then offer my latest thoughts on this. And then this will be, I'll be very interested to see kind of what you think about um, kind of my latest thoughts on this. And then after all of this is said and done, uh, we can go to any other objections um, and then talk about some other applications of, of, of the argument. So I realize we're going into a lot of detail, but let me, let me just go ahead and, and continue to talk about um, how I'm thinking about 
originally responding to this. So my original response was to make use of, now I have in my notes, the greatness principle that we already talked about. So I can already anticipate now worries that you'll have about this. But the idea that I had was that it, it takes some kind of um, value or quality that's positive in order for the thing to be a ground of other qualities that are positive. And so that was kind of part of my original thinking about this. And this was a reason to think that there's something different about the Trinity um, and greatness, because my thought is like, you wouldn't ground being tripersonal um, in terms of being um, tripersonal, obviously that would be circular. Okay. And I don't have the intuition that the three there presupposes a three in the same way that I have a kind of sense that it seems like value that arises would presuppose some sort of capacity to make that value, which I consider itself to have value. So that was a kind of a, a way in which I was thinking that um, there is, there's a response to the Trinity, the Trinity objection that, um, allows the advocate of this arbitrary limits argument to think of greatness as relevantly different from the number three because of this greatness principle. Um, and, and if that's right, then what you have is um, to kind of review the argument, you have a foundational reality that's purely great or perfect, has no fundamental limits in it, but it does have some fundamental greatness in order to be a ground for the other greatness. So that's the structure of the thinking. And I realize, you know, people could resist that greatness principle. There's a lot of more, more work, I think, to be done in clarifying different types of greatness principles. And so I wanted just to kind of point to that territory before, in a sense, joining you with a worry um, that I, I myself have been thinking about and then a response to that worry. But let me just see if you have any sort of comments or questions here. Uh, no, I think that's fine. I think we can go on to your worry and then the response. Okay. All right. Now you have these pictures that you put into the notes. I'm skipping past those beautiful pictures. Okay. It was here's the sponge my... cake. That's why yeah, I put sponge. it in there, right? Sponginess. It doesn't take sponginess to make sponginess. That's why I put yes, that in I love there. that example, actually, because that kind of even illustrates what I wanted to say about the Trinity. It doesn't take a Trinity to make a Trinity. Sort yeah. of the same idea. Um, but that doesn't mean, of course, that there can't be other cases where it does take something of a certain quality to make something else of that quality. Okay, so we can think more about that. But put to that to the side, sweep that away. Um, here's how I put the worry. And I think this is, it feels to me like it's similar to the worry, but from another angle, or is, is, is sort of another way of, of thinking about this worry that uh, maybe fundamental reality could somehow ground some basic limit in greatness. So Maybe there's just a way in which fundamental reality is, I think you were talking about like a trope that just like, just because of it, it grounds some boundaries and limits. Okay. And so if that's right, well, then we could give an explanation of its limit and greatness. And here's my response to that. I've been thinking a lot about this in the last few weeks. Uh, I've been thinking about a way in which arbitrariness can sort of seep down into the grounds of the thing that's being um, explained. And I think an example will help. So let's go back to this object. Let's say that there's some hidden attributes of this object that ground it's being pink and not other colors. So the way I put this arbitrariness principle is that if you have some property that's arbitrary and there's some other property that grounds the arbitrary property alone, it gr grounds just that property and not other ones, then the, the grounding property inherits that arbitrariness, at least to some degree, that it still sort of calls for an explanation. It's like if, if this is pink and the ground of the pink is not pink, it's still arbitrary. Why did it ground being pink rather than blue? Um, and by the way, because I know we've been using up a lot of time here, I want to just kind of point to how this is relevant to um, Platonism. You could be a Platonist and you could think that all the abstracta are just ungrounded, or you could think they're all grounded. But there, there's not an arbitrariness. It's not like there's this hole in the abstract landscape where all the abstract objects exist, except for the number seven, or the number seven is the only abstract object that exists. That would be arbitrary, it seems to me. So the idea is, what, what I'm trying to suggest is that um, if there was some property like the number seven, and it were grounded, in some other property that only grounds seven and not all the other numbers, 
then that would lead to an arbitrariness at the base of reality. And so if I'm wanting to remove arbitrariness as far as I can, this is going to give me a reason to think that the base of reality doesn't have arbitrary limits, and nor does it ground uh, particular limits. Because if it did, then the, the arbitrariness would be inherited down into the base of reality. So this is my application point. I say a perfect foundation keeps arbitrariness from seeping to the bottom of reality via the arbitrariness inheritance principle. And I acknowledge that this may put pressure on certain models of, of God. Um, if, if you think that certain models of God are going to actually build into the essence of God, certain arbitrary parameters that would seep to the bottom by a kind of grounding. And, um, but I'm, I'm curious to even explore the ramifications of this and sort of follow this pathway and sort of see, okay, what can this tell me about fundamental reality? In fact, I, I sort of think of it as a bonus. If an argument that can help to uncover the nature of fundamental reality can also clarify certain theological models. Um, and and I, I think it's helpful to think in terms of clarifying because there's a lot here that I don't understand, but if I can sort of think about this as helping to set one vision of reality apart from certain other competing visions, then I think of that as a, as a kind of progress. Um, and then just to kind of give a few other notes on this, uh, one could consider whether maybe there are other models that could do better, that could reduce arbitrariness in better ways. And I think that's an open project. I think that's an important project. And also, I want to go back to that sort of gentle version of the argument where you're trying to reduce arbitrariness as far as you can. So it might be that somebody, uh, what, what I have in the notes is one could leave open whether there is a deeper ground of certain limits. And then the conclusion of the argument would be more modest. It would be that fundamental reality is at least, you might call it quasi-perfect. That is to say, it's without arbitrary, unexplained limits in greatness, power, or whatever its attributes are. And then it could be an open question, sort of what this implies about the total nature of fundamental reality. What we get is that it's at, at least all of its um, parameters are explained as far as we can explain them. And so that would be kind of my latest, latest thoughts on how to think about, um, think very deeply about how to remove arbitrariness as far as I can, even granting that the greatness principle is, is not going to help us or it's not even true. Just here's a different path. It doesn't even require the greatness principle. It's just about arbitrariness seeping to the bottom. And, and I guess examples, honestly, kind of illustrate this kind of clearly to me. I mean, it just seems like if this is fundamental reality, then it would be arbitrary in its color and its shape. And if somebody says, oh, well, we can explain it, it's, it's necessity grounds it's being pink. Or it's, it's just it has some basic attribute. We don't know what it is. Um, and it, that attribute grounds it's being pink. Then I think, well, whatever that attribute is, it inherits the arbitrariness of the pinkness. So I just don't think that it would be fundamentally pink or even essentially pink. Uh, it seems like that wouldn't be the best theory, uh, at least not, not my best sort of working first guess um, as to what this, this thing would be. So I put a lot on the table here. Feel free to kind of clean up some of this mess if you'd like. Um, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I mean, that's the first thing that I want to say is that I think uh, these are serving the dialectic. That's a I mean, it's just the first thing to say. I mean, it's it's good to emphasize that at the beginning. Um, so we have this principle. Uh, if P, uh, where, so uh, P and Q are going to be properties here. So uh, if P is arbitrary and Q grounds P, then Q inherits that arbitrariness. So Q is also arbitrary. Um, so by arbitrary here, do you mean... Uh, so, so, so here, th this is like something, it was like almost preventing me from listening well, because I was just, uh, I, it was, it was rough for me. Because as I was thinking about arbitrariness, yeah. part of, part of uh, what I was thinking about from earlier in our conversation was that it's un unexplained. But I was thinking, well, okay, if it's unexplained, but, but it's grounded, and I think grounding underwrites explanation. So, I mean, I, I was like, if P is arbitrary, but then Q grounds P, but that means that yeah, P is explained. Thank you. Yeah, so I was thinking so about like, that second concept of it being sort of on that continuum of more okay. or less, and it's not like relevantly different. Like if it's blue, that's arbitrary, because why is it blue rather than red? Okay, you know. that helps. So, uh, that yeah. helps. Okay, that helps. Um, so that's the first thing that I, I wanted clarification on. Yeah, thank you um, for that. 
Yeah, the second thing was, um, okay, so if P is arbitrary and Q grounds P, then Q inherits that arbitrariness. And so would itself um, require uh, explanation essentially, or at least call out for explanation. One of my thoughts was like, I mean, how does this relate to like God and creation? I mean, uh, God is supposed to be explaining the arbitrary limits in creation. And uh, I mean, to the extent that this principle for me is plausible with respect to grounding, it's plausible with respect yeah. to explanation more generally. So if P is arbitrary and uh, Q explains P, then Q inherits that arbitrariness. But there are arbitrary, there are, there's, I mean, there's arbitrariness in creation in the sense of things that call out for explanation. Uh, and uh, God explains those things, but it doesn't follow that like God or like aspect, no, it doesn't follow that God would thereby be arbitrary or inherit that arbitrariness. Now, yes, I mean, I guess that's one worry. It's like, how do you get to this arbitrary, how do you prevent this arbitrariness from seeping down into God if, uh, if there's arbitrariness in creation and God in some manner grounds creation? Uh, you get what I'm saying? I, I'm not yeah, I really articulating so. yeah, this well. I, I've been thinking about this as well. I, and I've been kind of wondering if there's an important difference between a kind of strong grounding where I, I'm thinking in terms of the grounding literature, you know, one of the conditions, as, as you know, is a kind of necessitating condition, which is controversial, admittedly. And yeah. Kenny, but, Kenny Pierce has a nice article under review questioning that, but yeah, okay. Yeah. But let's just build that into the the concept in play. And then I want to distinguish this kind of necessary strong grounding from other kinds of creative relations. Um, so you know, maybe there's a kind of indeterminacy where I could sort of choose or willfully you know, raise one hand rather than another. It's not that it's completely without any non-deterministic explanation. Like maybe there's reasons that provide a kind of indeterministic explanation. But I would think of that as different than grounding. And this is just kind of a, a confession. Like when I think of these other creative relations that build in indeterminacy, I don't have that same kind of pull to think that arbitrariness is sort of seeping down the relation, if that makes sense. It really is when it's that tight, grounded, strong, necessitating. See, that that's the look of, of, of somebody who's sharing my feeling is that am i right is that the look <laughs> of somebody who's about to destroy my idea? <laughs> no i'm so sorry josh so like i don't i don't know what to think about for the free will debate so i'll, I'll talk okay. about how this Fair is enough. relevant yeah. um to me it's just like this qu quagmire quagmire of like and this morass of confusion and it's just difficulty and it's so difficult uh the free will. anyway yeah yeah the free will I, I literature is just that. it's yeah. it's right insane um yeah. But but like I I do kind of share some of these like luck worries like with respect to libertarianism you know like sort of like rollback worries where um ah oh man like it does really sometimes seem to me like arbitrary uh this sort of well maybe it is so these maybe, other maybe, explanatory maybe relations possible for there to be some kind of arbitrary spontaneous actions um, we can sort of leave that open the point is is that that kind of arbitrariness owing to a kind of spontaneity is going to be different than the kind of arbitrariness that seeps through the relation of strong grounding, if that makes sense. So yeah, fundamental so reality could sort of creatively that? make a world with all sorts of interesting things. It's not like completely arbitrary, but there's indeterminacy sort of built into the creativity um, that would be different from the kind of strong relationship between, let's say, you know, being um, five-sided and then something that grounds being five-sided alone. Okay, so I'm I'm probably I'm gonna have to think about that one. Um, my intuitions right now are tepid on the matter, so I'm gonna have to think about that. Um, that's that's just what I'm gonna say. I think it's beautiful yeah, to enough. confess that, and that, like uh, honestly, well, I'm, I'm um, gonna keep thinking about it too. So um, yeah, fair enough. I, I've been sort of looking at this. I I don't know why, Joe. I just keep having this picture of the leaves. These leaves because they're so kind of like small and wrinkly, you know, all of these different concepts. So. I think we are sort of deep in the leaves uh, here, and there's certainly more for me to think about as well. Yeah, I mean, one one thing before uh, before we get on to whatever next point. I mean, honestly, this is probably one of the, the final points. I mean, we have you know, the, like yeah, you said, probably, there are probably object... wise for us to kind of yeah. round things off here soon. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I mean, 
of course, you know, Josh and I both recognize. I think uh, Josh said certain objections, and then he has said oh uh, one, oh two, oh three for certain objections. Then he said oh four throughout oh infinity, and I'm like, yes, that is great. yeah. And that was a left three, by the way. It wasn't a left no. So we've got a long way to go, Cameron. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm still stuck on the point that Joe made a long time ago about uh, like fundamental particles and like universal wave function, like not having any value. I just that blew my mind because I don't share that intuition at all. Well, let me make this final point. Um, the like I, I so Josh, I'm very sensitive to models of God debates. I'm very interested in that, and yeah. um, I like looking at how different. Uh, natural theological arguments affect how one has to conceive of God and how that affects one's model of God. Uh, you cannot divorce the reasons that you have for believing in God from your model of God on the one hand. Like if you want to affirm a particular model of God, let's say, which has a, a strong doctrine of divine simplicity, but you're mounting these certain arguments for theism, which themselves include something which might be in tension with the doctrine of divine simplicity, for instance. I mean, that that's difficult, right? So you need to be very, not you, but you as in universal you, you need to be very attentive when you're mounting natural theological arguments uh, and kind of that reflective equilibrium with how that interacts with your model of God. Uh, and, and one thing that I have a worry about with respect to like the grounding and the limits and things like that is that if we go this route where there's like a in some manner, a deeper ground in God of God's uh, tri-personality, as it were, or being, being tri-personal. Um, I do worry whether or not that conflicts with the doctrine of divine simplicity, and at least the traditional doctrine. Uh, because, I mean, it seems to create, like, two different layers in God, one of which is the foundational or fundamental layer, and which yeah. stands in a grounding relation to a non-fundamental layer. And these seem to be just, like, positive ontological items within God that are that are not themselves God. And that's going to be in conflict, at least with traditional articulations of the doctrine of divine simplicity. Now, again, Josh, like I know you're not uh, beholden to those, but uh, people in Cameron's audience may very well be beholden to those. And it's significant to note that potentially some responses to this Trinitarian worry might prevent them from uh, affirming this traditional doctrine of divine simplicity in addition. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, it's significant. And yeah, anyway, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that style there. I was about to tease you, Joe, you're you're starting to risk oppressing people in Cameron's audience. I'm just kidding. But you you put that so wonderfully, you know, this might affect that. And that actually is a gift. It really serves the audience so well because it invites everybody to really think about it. And I've even been wondering if this sort of style of looking for reducing arbitrary limits and boundaries could point towards a certain concept of divine simplicity at the foundation of the foundation, if that makes sense. But then there are interesting questions about that, how that might relate to other theological models. Um, absolutely. And so there's a lot of open work here to be done. You know, we are at the edge of history. I'm not saying presentism is true necessarily, but um, <laughs> we're, we're thinking at the edges here. And um, this is what I like talking with you about the edges. So Cameron, you... I know we're toward the end. I am itching to share my wife's concept of the Trinity as a kind of like a way to bring home, not, not the Trinity, sorry, the triad concept of perfection as a way to draw home, I think, an application of this of this argument from arbitrary limits. So let okay. me know what you, what you want to do. But that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll Go ahead. Let's that. let's do that. And then we'll we'll try to close it out. OK, sounds good. So I was talking with um, my favorite conversation partner, my wife, about all these things. And uh, she really helps sort my thoughts a lot. And she was giving me this picture. So she's kind of an artist. And she gave me this picture of a triangle with three points. And these points have labels, power, positivity, and um, persistence. And so now if the argument from arbitrary limits is inviting us to think of fundamental reality, in a way that shaves off arbitrary limits as far as we can, that explains things as far as we can. What Rachel was suggesting to me is that this could perhaps give us a concept of fundamental reality as perf perfect in this sense. Its power is not fundamentally or arbitrarily limited. Its positivity is not fundamentally or arbitrarily limited. And its persistence is not fundamentally or arbitrarily lim limited. So its persistence would be sort of its existence either timelessly or through all time. To illustrate this, you wouldn't expect fundamental reality 
to exist just like on Wednesdays and then go out of existence, come back like on Tuesdays sometimes and then Wednesdays. Some, that, that, that would be to think that it has some limits that would kind of call for further explanation. And I was thinking that there's a kind of interesting sort of bootstrapping problem with each of the three Ps, the persistence, positivity, and power. And that you might think that just as it might, you know, this is, we could debate this, but you might think that just as it takes a certain kind of positive aspect to produce positivity, it takes existence to make oneself exist. So you can't have this kind of gappy existence where it makes itself exist and go out of existence. Same with power. It takes power to give itself power. And if that's right, this might lead you to think that the least arbitrary account of fundamental reality is going to be one where it has maximal power, maximal persistence, persistence in existence across all times and all worlds, um, or, or perhaps it's timeless, either timeless or all times, um, and then maximally positive. And then if we want to be gentle and are thinking about applying this argument, we could say, hey, you know what? Reduce the arbitrariness as far as you can. And either this is going to result in a completely perfect foundation that has maximal power, persistence, and positivity, or it will at least give you some kind of quasi perfection where it has as much power and persistence and positivity as is consistent with removing arbitrariness as far as you can. And so then that kind of leaves op um, something open for people as they're, as they're thinking about it. Um, so those are kind of my main thoughts. There are some sort of extra ideas in the book, how reason can lead a God. Joe knows this. I have this modal argument where if we could, instead of having an actual explanation of limits, maybe all we need is a possible explanation of limits. And so maybe some limits have no actual explanation, but if there's even a, a possible explanation, then there's a path from there to a possible perfect being. And then from a possible perfect being, you follow a certain path to an actual perfect being, because if you think perfection implies spanning all the possible worlds. Um, Joe knows about that kind of argument. He's got his responses and reservations to that. And actually, a lot of those responses are structurally similar to the kinds of responses that we've been exploring together uh, with respect to this classic ar uh, argument from arbitrary limits. It's not entirely the same, but a lot of it is, is similar. So I hope this is helpful as just kind of a way of pointing to some of the main issues in play. And that's it. This is all I've, I've got for now in my notes. All right. So <clears throat> earlier on in the stream, we had a super chat come in and they've asked us to put it up on the screen so that people can uh, just think about it. We don't have to address it here uh, with you two, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it out here. Thoughts from both on my definition of limits and if it changes their arguments. And here's his definition. Limits are permeable thresholds that confine a system to a specific state or set of states. So uh, again, we don't we don't have to really get into details here. If you'd like uh, to comment on this, then do so in the comments of this video. Unless, uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of coming up on time here, but if, if unless you guys really want to discuss this, uh, I, I was going to turn to uh, sort of summary type thoughts at this point. I just have but, one kind of quick thought. Uh, it's a very interesting proposal and I'd want to think more about it. Um, where the intuition that the limit calls for an explanation kind of has the most life in my mind is if I think of it not just as a specific state, but as a kind of quantitative um, parameter on a, on a continuum of neighbors. So like mm -hmm. four sides, um, you know, that sort of a thing, six legs. Um, that, that, that's where it sort of calls for an explanation the most in my mind. But I do think that this definition could also be plugged into a form of the argument. I would have to think more about that, though. Okay, uh, we've, we've let Josh, uh, I mean, let's just turn it to Joe and let him kind of share his thoughts. And then from there, we'll use that as a springboard to, to close out the conversation. Uh, we, we even started, I think, with Josh at the very beginning to kind of lay out the argument. So let's give Joe... Uh, time to to just share his his closing thoughts. I'm I'm sure that they're going to be really good. So, uh, take it away, Joe. Well, I was thinking about starting dancing. I mean, <laughs> uh, but I guess I'm <laughs> I guess I'm not going to do that. Or I could just scream like a doggy, really, in a weird voice. But I guess not. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but okay, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Well, firstly, this is just, you know, groundbreaking history, as Josh said, you know, we're at the 
edge of history. Maybe we are, maybe we aren't. I, I, I don't really know. But um, no, I mean, it, it, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I mean, for the audience, I mean, to recap the argument, right? We're assuming the stage, stage one case that there's some fundamental reality. And then we're trying to tease out what that fundamental reality is or would be like. And uh, we're doing that with the form of an argument, an argument from limits. And the basic structure is saying that limits, which are non-maximal degrees, so like a quantity with different neighbors, as Josh put it. And the idea is that limits have further explanations. And you can motivate this in different ways, like appeal to irrelevant differences or appeals to intuition or induction or whatever. Uh, and then you go on to say that, well, because fundamental reality is fundamental, it doesn't have a further explanation, it's not going to be limited. Uh, and what that means is that if it has any greatness, then it, the amount of greatness that it has, the extent of its greatness is going to have to be unlimited. And of course, the idea is that if it's unlimited greatness, then it has to be perfect. Uh, and of course, we went through different challenges to the inferential steps here, um, different cases of maybe not sharing intuitions or different cases of competing causal principles, uh, maybe cases where theory comparison comes in and uh, premises coming out as false according to certain non-theistic theories and things like that. Um, but I mean, that that's sort of the basic thrust of, of the conversation. And I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Josh for this wonderful conversation. Thank you to Cameron for putting it together. And uh, I always enjoyed the time that, uh, that we spend together. So. Yeah, this was excellent. And I'm glad that we did this instead of like uh, just a series of response videos, which I mean, Who's to say that that won't still happen <laughs> after something like this? We'll have to, we'll just have to see where things go from here. But yeah, no, I, I did also want to say, I appreciate both of you coming on to, uh, to my channel to, to discuss this. Cause you obviously could have gone on to your own Joe and, uh, and done it there. But, um, yeah, this has been great. I, I, I appreciate you both taking the time to do this and, as always, I really do want to know uh, from my audience what you think of this type of content, what, what you thought, like if you have any objections to things that were talked about tonight, uh, let, let me know. I mean, it's 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 you can play a part in furthering the conversation as well. So uh, please do that. We'll be checking the comments as, as we can. But um, yeah, I'll just kind of close it out there. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, I, I should have mentioned earlier that we do have some free resources linked in the description of every video. So check that out. Uh, also become a patron if you like this type of content and want to continue to see it or want to see it continue. Uh, more about that in the description of this video. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you in the next uh, Capturing Christianity video. See you guys later. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?